after this too. Right? Okay, there we go. Uh, so welcome, Composer Plugins 101. Um, so the idea behind this talk is Composer has become a tool that we all pretty much have to use for Drupal 9, and that's actually not a bad thing. Um, it's actually a quite good thing once you start thinking or, or, or really digging into like how Drupal is put together with dependencies and um, how vibrant the PHP ecosystem is. And if you're a custom module developer, chances are you're probably not taking full advantage of the PHP ecosystem. Um, uh, and, and Composer kind of allows you to do that in a, in a relatively easy way. So it's, it's one of those kind of foundational level tools for Drupal developers that was kind of at first, I don't want to say forced upon us, but set upon us as, you know, with, with Drupal 8. Um, but now that we're getting more comfortable with it and we understand the basic functionality and it's, it's become part of our workflow, um, you know, it's, it's also a good idea to think about, you know, how can we do more with Composer? You know, we add modules to Drupal all the time, contrib modules to Drupal to extend the functionality of Drupal. Well, Composer is a PHP application. And it can be extended. Only we don't call them modules, we call them plugins. So Composer plugins are you know, um, analogous to Drupal modules. They extend the functionality of Composer. Um, when we think about the Composer require statement, and I'm probably talking ahead of my slides a little bit. Oh yeah, there we go. We can, uh, if you want the slides, there's the URL. Um, if you think about Composer and when you do a Composer require, um, normally we're adding, as Drupal developers, Drupal modules, right? Um, but there's actually four types of things that Composer require um, can add, you know, at least by default. Um, and modules or libraries are just one of them. Um, you can also add uh, plugins, which is going to be the topic today. Meta packages which is basically just a bucket of other dependencies. It's a way of grouping, a group, it's a way of grouping dependencies into a single dependency. Um, and that's exactly what Drupal slash core recommended is. If you go on GitHub or look at the, the well, here, I'll do it right now because it's simple. GitHub.com slash Drupal slash core recommended. Oop. That's an overzealous autocomplete right there. And if we go to just the most recent version of Drupal, you know, this is the entire code for core recommended. You know, and all this is, you see the type is meta package, but all this is, is basically just a list of dependencies. You know, pin dependencies, you know, exact versions that are compatible with 936. So, um, let them pull us out of that rabbit hole. So we've got libraries, we have uh, composer plugins, uh, or plugins, we have meta packages, and we have projects, which is kind of like the, the end user, which is, you know, when we build a Drupal project, it's a composer thing of type project. Um, but this, today, we're mainly going to focus on um, uh, plugins. Yeah, so I, I, I talk ahead of my slides all the time, so... There we go, there we go, add it as a dependency. All right, so if you think about it, let's continue the analogy, you add a module to Drupal core, very few modules, um, you add Drupal core and don't do any configuration, right? I mean, what, maybe redirect, right? That's the one that always pops in my head where it does have a configuration page, but the defaults are good for the vast majority of sites. Um, but plugins are, you know, since they're analogous, you might have settings for plugins. You might have to configure the plugin, but there's no UI for Composer. You don't go to a site and pull up the UI. Um, you configure plugins via your Composer.json file um, in the extras section. And we'll talk about that when we start doing some of the demos a bit more. Um, starting with Composer 2.2, which was released not too long ago. Uh, I, I had the date in my head a couple days ago, but... Um, there's a new feature, or it's, well, maybe not a feature, but it's um, Composer will now specifically ask you or explicitly ask you, do you trust this plugin that you're using? 
because as plugins extend Composer, and Composer is installed in, you know, as an application, your pl the plugins have access to the file system. So since a plugin is just a type of Composer dependency, theoretically you could add some dependency that, you know, you go to the project page and you read about the dependency and maybe it's a, a Drupal module or something else, but that dependency can have its own dependency on a plugin. And that plugin has access to your file system. So if you're not careful, you could actually be opening the door um, to plugins running a mock on your machine. Um, so what um, with Composer 2.2, and uh, we might see it today, when you require a new plugin, it's going to ask you, um, you know, do you want to give this plugin permission to, uh, uh, or do you want to enable this plugin? I mean, do you want to allow this plugin to actually run? Um, and there's actually a new allow plugins section in Composer.json that gets written when you say yes, and I'll show you that. So these are the ones we're going to discuss. Um, Composer installers, which is kind of like, uh, it's almost, you know, could be considered part of Composer core at this point, or the, the main application. Uh, but we're going to talk about exactly what that does. Uh, core Composer scaffold, which is part of the Drupal recommended project. Um, again, that's one of those plugins that a lot of people just use, but don't realize it's, it's very extensible and it does a lot of really cool things, so we can do a demo of that. Um, probably the, the non-default um, plugin that most Drupal developers are familiar with is Composer Patches, which makes patching, you know, your site, either core or module or something, just you know, stupid easy. Um, and then there's a few others. So there's Composer Installers Extender, and you know, we'll talk about some of these other ones as well. Um, so I can demo any of these or all of these. I don't think we'll have time to do all of them. So um, I'm going to go through the slides really quick the first time and just you know, explain what each one does. And then I'll ask you which ones we want to see, which demos we want to do, and then we'll fill the rest of the time with demos and questions. All right, so Composer Installers, part of our standard Composer template. Um, and this is the you know, Composer plugin that allows dependencies to go somewhere other than vendor. All right, so when I, when I teach Composer, um, normally the first thing I'll do is we'll, we'll even, we'll take Drupal out of the equation and we'll just like do a Composer init on a new project. Which if you're a Drupal developer, you might not even know that there is a Composer init, right? You can go to an empty directory and start a project by doing composer init, kind of like you do git init. Um, and if you, you know, if you start a brand new project and then you go to add Drupal, or you go to add core recommended, you go, you know, composer require Drupal slash core recommended, that's gonna end up in the vendor directory. And you're gonna end up with your project slash vendor slash core. And that's not where you want Drupal core. Generally, you want Drupal core in a web or Docker directory somewhere away from vendor. So, Composer Installers is the plugin that you configure that says, hey, Composer, whenever you require a dependency of type Drupal core, don't put it in vendor, put it over there in Docker. Um, and that's how modules get in the right place, that's how themes get in the right place. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the nice things about our, our default template that we use, the Composer, uh, the Drupal recommended project template, is all that stuff's pre-configured for us. So we, we really don't even have to think about that. But we can tweak it and mess with it. Um, Composer Installers Extender basically allows you to do similar things but with generally JavaScript packages or non-PHP packages. So um, things that you, you know, that um, are dependencies that you have that are not PHP projects, normally the NPM or stuff like that, um, you can actually use Composer to manage. So I've done this in the past to um, get the Bootstrap framework in the right place. You know, I'm not going to find Bootstrap framework on packages. Um, I'll find that on NPM asset. Well, here's a plugin that allows you to uh, treat NPM assets like composer um, dependencies. So we can do a demo of this one. Literally, we'll, we'll do the bootstrap one because that's the demo I have set up. And 
Um, Core Composer Scaffold, we get this one for free, um, and most people just, you know, use it, um, you know, without any customization. But you can actually do a lot with this. You know, one of the things I do by default in every client project I have is I don't want, like, the README and the change log and all those default Drupal files installed.txt. You don't need those in your code base out in production. So you can very quickly and easily tweak your composer.json file so, and tell Drupal core composer scaffold, I don't want those scaffolding files. Don't make them part of the project root. Um, composer patches, uh, yeah, seriously easy patching. Um, composer lock diff, so these last two are kind of like reporting, um, kind of utility ones, which are kind of cool. Um, so, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory what's up there, but if you have this uh, installed, um, and, you know, if you are the, if you're brave, unlike me, and do naked composer update, and just hope, you know, where it updates all of your dependent, dependencies at once, um, then uh, this will actually, uh, after you run the composer update, it'll print out a nice little table in your command line of, you know, this dependency went from this version to that version. So it's a, it's a cool little thing. Um, well, actually, no. Okay, so I forgot about this one. So this is a good one if you commit your dependencies to a repository. So the preferred way of building a Drupal code base is to um, not commit your dependencies to a repository and then every environment you push to or maybe have a CI machine that does your uh, composer install for you. If you're in a situation where you don't, where you do commit your dependencies, um, you know, a lot of folks who were like host on Pantheon um, before uh, Pantheon introduced their um, uh, composer integrated workflow um, had to commit dependencies to the, to the repository. Um, if when you have a dependency, or, or, or let's be honest, you know, you're on top of 100, a dev module, a dev version of a Drupal module, um, you end up with a dot git directory you know, inside that module. So basically now you've got a dot git directory inside your project, so git calls out a submodule, that messes up your git commits and stuff. So all this dependency does is anytime there's a composer require, a composer update, or a composer remove run, or composer I say install, or a composer install, this will basically just delete those sub uh, those, those dot git directories so that you can commit your dependencies easily. Saves you from having to do it manually. Here's the other reporting one I was talking about. All this does is it just keeps an easy to read composer manifest.yaml file in the project root for you. Um, it just shows you the current version of all your dependencies. Um, you know, it's kind of similar to the update status page of, of Drupal, but this has all of your dependencies, not just your Drupal module dependencies. Um, so I've actually gotten in the habit of I don't use update status page, this is kind of a little aside, so on a gray box on the side of the page over here. I don't use um, the update report and the update status page as much as I used, used to. Um, I use the, uh, um, the composer, on, it, it, just, it just left my head. Updated. Yeah, composer outdated dash dash direct, um, which shows, it's like update status, but it's not Drupal specific. It shows you all of your dependencies the ones that need to get updated. So that's a very, you know, and it's on the command line, so if you're on the command line a lot, you know, it's, it's, it's comfortable to do and it's relatively fast. And it catches like, oh look, there's a, an update to composer installers or, compo or, or composer patches or something else. It doesn't just show you your Drupal modules. So I think it's the last one. Uh, yeah, okay, so, what's that? Someone you showed me a couple of years ago I was like, how did I not know about that? Yeah, composer outdated. Regularly. Yeah. yeah. You can do just regular old composer outdated, but that was usually very long on the Drupal site because it shows you sub dependencies as well. And most of Drupal core's dependencies are behind. Um, so, this is another one we get for free in Drupal co uh, recommended project, the core project message dependency. Um, and you know, if you're familiar with this one, all this one does is after you do a, um, um, a composer create project um, using that uh, the Drupal recommended project template, 
this just puts a nice message up for you. It says, hey, welcome to Drupal. Here are some links. Um, normally, my workflow when I'm spinning up new sites is I will do my composer create, I will add Drush and the admin toolbar, and then I will remove this event. Um, not because it does anything bad, but just it, it, it's not really necessary. Um, so it's a way to just re remove code from your site, and it's a way to actually clean up your composer.json because this module, all that text you see is actually inside of your composer.json. So it, for me, I like my composer.json to be nice and clean and organized, so I can get rid of like you know probably a dozen lines in there, and, and, and that's kind of nice. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So, all right. So let's go back to the list. Um, so, are there any of these or or features of these that anyone like really wants to see, or should I just? Which is fine. Yeah, you can see the installer's extender. Okay. Yeah. We do that one. else? Strong feelings? Yeah. I might just see the manifest one where it lists everything. Okay. Yeah, manifest. All right. All right, so Composer Installers Extend. So I actually have, I forgot to open it, of course, because that's the way I'm rolling. So, uh, Composer Basics. Okay, so. One of these days I'm going to figure out what to do with this. Uh, I'm going to call it a document, but I feel like it's like a small book at least because it's like 60 pages of composer goodness. Um, so let me just, I have this demo actually in here. Uh, composer. composer. There we go. Okay. All right, so let's go to NPM Asset. Do I have that right? NPM Asset? Why isn't it auto-completing? Close that out. Come here. Oh, Asset Packages. Okay, that's the problem right there. All right, so again, this, uh, the, well, I should probably show you the, the plugin as well. <coughs> Packages. O N P H. There we go. All right, so this is the one we're going to talk about. The oomph ink. Um, composer installers extender. Uh, any arbitrary package type. I, you know, I've in the wild really only seen this used with uh, npm packages or, or similar. Um, but this is one we're going to use, and I believe I already have this one installed. So let me just cut out my composer.json. Uh, yeah, so this one's already installed, but, you know, just for the heck of it, I'll just, you know, do a composer require, oh, and, and let me copy and paste it because it's just easier. Mm. So this is going to tell me it's already installed. But you install you know, plugins, for those of you new to this, install plugins the exact same way you install um, uh, Drupal modules with Composer. Um, so once you do that, it's all about configuration. Um, so we are actually going to uh, use uh, Bootstrap. We're going to put boot, the Bootstrap, Bootstarp, that's a new one. So NPM, oh, that's where I was getting the npmasset.org from here. Okay. So this is basically the bootstrap framework. Um, so this is, we want, we want to build a theme off this, and we don't want to use like bootstrap Mario or one of the Drupal-based themes. Um, so the idea is we want to load this dependency, not in the vendor directory. Well, I guess theoretically we could put it in the vendor directory. Um, but we want to put this in... Um, the, the, the doc root, so web slash themes slash custom slash my thing. Right, we want this dependency to go there. Um, so how do we do that? Where am I? Okay. So we can actually, I've already have this in here, so it's a, it's a couple step process. Uh, number one, we have to basically add a new repository to our composer.json. So this little section of repositories right here, 
this tells packages where else, I'm sorry, tells composer where else to look for packages other than packages. So by default, composer will always go to packages.com. When you require something, composer is going to look at packages.com and say, hey, packages.org, actually. You know, I need the, you know, the composer installers dependency. Um, but this section allows you to tell composer, hey, in addition to packages.org, also check any other places listed in here. So this entry, you know, the first one, the Drupal one, is obviously how we get Drupal modules and base things and things like that. Um, but this one is, is you know, how Composer can get stuff from asset packages, because asset packages exposes their own um, Composer repository as well. So that's kind of handy. Um, and then we come down. So let's see, there's one more section, where is it? There we go. So we need the help of composer installers. Um, we need composer installers. We need to tell composer installers that, hey, if we try to add this dependency, a dependency with the vendor name, npm asset bootstrap, don't put that in the vendor directory, put it in web themes, custom, okay, my bootstrap theme, slash bootstrap. So the dependency is going to end up in a bootstrap directory right there. Um, and we also need one more installer type just so, and this is basically, um, uh, oh, I should, let me talk about the extra section for a second. So I kind of skipped over that. So let me, let me go back. Sorry about that. So as I said earlier, when you add a plugin that needs configuration or needs preferences saved, all those go in the extra section. Now, one little pet peeve of mine is that um, the, the key for the extra section is arbitrarily decided by the plugin author, which is kind of annoying. And, and Composer Installers is a great example of this because the plugin is Composer Installers, but the extra key is Installer Paths. So it's close, but it's not exact. Same thing with the the core composer scaffold, the key is just Drupal scaffold. So you kind of have to know that, you know, when, when you add a new plugin, like what is the key, you know, the, the array key that you use in the extra section. Um, I think it'd be much better if they were consistent, right? If it was required that this was, you know, core composer scaffold, and this was uh, you know, just in installers, and this was, uh, let's see. Composer installers instead. Maybe there's a reason that I'm missing why it's not like that, but it's kind of like one of those little bits of knowledge that once you know it, okay, you have to match them up. Um, but anyway, the, when you add the Composer installers extender, the uh, its configuration goes in the installer types section, um, and you're basically just giving it a list of the type of uh, assets you want to add. Yeah. Could it be that you know, that way most plugins can all be using the same like the installer paths is used by both installer extenders and installers? Uh, the, I think it can already be. I think when you have a plugin, uh, when you're writing code for a plugin, it can access everything in the extra section. Right, and that's why they, you know, they're arbitrary because that way, uh, if they were like keyed to the plugin name itself, so if I was saying composer slash installer slash installer paths, then it would be all more namespaced and everything would be, yeah, there wouldn't be any collisions, so they wouldn't be able to share either. But would it, would it matter though? Would, isn't there the same risk of collisions with or without the name? Or am I, uh, maybe I'm not understanding what you're saying. Instead of the key, you know, in the extra section, instead of the key that they have there, yeah. if they, the top key was the name of the plugin, right. slash installer, and then underneath that they put install paths or whatever other. Yeah. Uh, settings they want, then you know, they would be namespaced basically. Right. And you wouldn't end up with a So you're agreeing with me that that would be better? Or you I just. Have two minds on it, really. Okay. I mean, yes, that's kind of the nicer way to do it. Uh, yeah. Certainly, that's a, a very Drupal way to do it because we, all the settings files we have are all namespaced. I wouldn't say it's a Drupal, I'd just say it's a consistent way. <laughs> yeah. But it means that they can't share. You can't have well known. I guess. Top level keys yeah. like installer paths and installer types. All right. All right.
All right, so moving on. So uh, you have the repository, you have the installer types. If you want it to go you know, somewhere other than vendor, you add it to installer pass. Um, and then at that point, it's just a matter of, and so I'm going to copy and paste this. Although, actually, you know what? I think I have it here. Do I, um, do I have it here? No, I don't have it there. I got it in the doc. Do, do, do. We did that, we did that, we did that, and then we just a regular old composer require at this point. Oh, cancel. Sorry, cancel. DDEV. I have Composer on my host as well, but it's a different version of PHP, and if anyone's ever hit that button once, you'll never hit it again, which is why I was so quick there. So I think I already have it. Yeah, so, um, you know, using 5.1, did it actually, yeah, nothing to modify, because I, I already did it during practice, but it would have, um, you know, the normal stuff here. And then we'll be able to see here ls al web slash theme slash custom slash my slash bootstrap. And you know, there's the, the dependency right there. There's so the is code. it version aware even though it's not really composer? Yeah, I actually, yeah, because it ends up in your composer.lock. And actually, here we go. So I actually have the, I believe I have the manifest already installed. So let's check <coughs> composer manifest. Let's see if it, I, and I, that's a great question because I know it's version aware. I don't know if it's going to end up in here. I assume it is. Where's N? Yeah. yeah. It treats it just like a. So this is a composer manifest. So literally, there's nothing. You, you require a composer manifest, there's no configuration, and all it does is just spit out this file for you. Um, that's really nice because like I've done it before where we add extra repos, but it's just basically pulling from Git of whatever that you know NPM project is. Right. And you have to do so many weird workarounds if there's a yeah. updated version with the cache and things like that that this kind of skirts right. really nicely. I wouldn't use this for like your front end tooling. But um, what do you mean by front end tooling there? Uh, I wouldn't use this if you're using NPM to like build like your 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 gulp your, you know. Oh no! Like we uh, yeah. we have separate repos that are um, like with web components and things like okay. that in there yeah. to hold them down. Right, right, right. Um, the other place I've uh, I've seen this used, but it wasn't as clean of a demo, so I decided not to do it. Is the the Drupal uh, the chosen module? You guys know that chosen module? And it, it may have changed. I, I, this is about a year ago that I set this demo up because um, it's a, it's a, it changes a regular select, I believe. It's, no, it's not select or other. Let me. No, it gives you um, like nicer checkboxes, I believe. And of course, the internet. I'll give this a second. Um, but the chosen module has a dependency on a JavaScript, like a jQuery library or something. Um, and the last I checked, it didn't automatically install that dependency for you. So this is uh, this plugin is a nice way of getting that chosen JavaScript library, uh, just you know, as part of like your regular workflow and not having to like download it separately and put it in a step in the right folder. And I guess the internet is not. So basically, you know, what you're saying is that. This would work just the same, you know, project directory. You have projects in the same It is. I mean, that's, we're, we're using the same. It's all. It's, it, yeah, I mean, we've got this right now in the Drupal composer.json, but if you went down into project. Um, oh, like a modules composer.json? Yeah. Or the, oh, yeah, it'd be great if the maintainer, but then the, well, then that module will have dependency on the composer installer's extender, which is fine. But yeah, the, the module maintainer could 100%, um, you know, if they added the dependency to Composer Installer's extender, then it can be completely handled by the module maintainer, which is what I was trying to track, check. I bit my tongue super early this morning eating a banana, and now I know, like, when you bite it once, and you keep on, I keep on biting it, and it's, it's making me a little mental. So oh, there we go. Like module required it, though, since 2.2, would you have to put that in the allow plugins, then, if you didn't already have it? For the for primary project, your site's composer. Um, no, because when you, it, yes, you would, but starting with Composer 2.2, when you added your requirement, like on this module, uh -huh. 
composer would see that it has a dependency on a plug and it would prompt you. Okay. So you wouldn't have to do that manually. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, so this is chosen. Um, you know, it adds, it, yeah, that's what it does. Yeah, I knew it did something like that. It adds like the little, adds an atom that kind of adds the little options. Um, so I don't know if it has, let me see the last time. October, yeah, I don't, well, three, I don't know. Um, I'm going to check real quick, see if this has been updated. Uh, source code. Oh, well, it does have this now. So maybe it's... Uh, Yeah, so I wonder how that's. Well, yeah, they, so they just have this here. So I guess this is going to end up in Venge. So I guess the 3.0 version of um, Chosen, you know, just handles it and puts it in Vendor and then links to it in the Vendor directory. So this is, it's not really a valid example for this use case because that module takes care of it now. But, um, Regardless, it's still it's still valid for um, other other dependencies that you might want to use that are you know on asset packages. All right, uh, so I think those are the two that we that were requested, right? So we talked. Oh, we talked a little bit about Composer installers there. Composer installers extender. Um, Composer manifest. I'm Can willing to stop. I'll put real quick. Yeah. That's this one. So it's just putting out the version numbers you're using versus like the dash dash outdated or. It's, yeah, no, it's, this is just a, a super readable version of your composer at lock with uh -huh. the only number you really want. <laughs> Pagestone will do that when you're viewing your composer.json file. Yeah, it? yeah. Composer.json will show you the little gray. What did I just no. PHP Storm? Did I say PHP Storm? Yeah, PHP Storm okay. will do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. If, uh, I, yeah, PHP Storm, when you're opening the Composer on JSON, and I don't have PHP I think Storm. It just reads out the lock file. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It does. Yep. Yep. But I, I can see this, Andy, because like, right now, managing like 12 different sites, it's nice to have. We're actually working kind of a central database of what they're running, the different version numbers, so we can see if there's security updates. Or right, you can easily do a diff on this. And this, so this one and. The composer lock diff kind of do you know serve the same purpose. Well, composer but, lock diff I see is a little different. Like I hate when I get merge requests and there's a composer lock change because it's usually too big to show if someone just did a wild composer update. Right. Um, so this the composer lock diff is kind of nice. So I don't get you know just my eye yeah. plays over or whatever. But well, maybe the way I should have said it is I think the this one. Um, you know, when you run your composer update and you just want to know what changed, you can look at your, you know, either use composer and lock diff and look at the, uh, the, that little report, or you can just do a git diff on this file. Mm -hmm. And then you basically just see what my, what's been updated. That's, that's, I guess, what I was getting at. Which could be hard to track because sometimes it decides to rearrange stanzas. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Darren. Does, uh, do, can plugins provide uh, additional composer commands? Yeah, they can, absolutely. So a good example of that is, well, I mean, there's a couple just in, with these. I know that Composer Cleanup VCS directories, um, I mean, Composer Installers has one, but that's kind of the easy, that's the low-hanging fruit. So let me just show you this one first. Um, you could have a Composer Manifest command that would just output the file, uh, display the file for you. There, that might even exist, yeah. So with this one, um, this will automatically run after composer install and require and remove. Or I know that, yeah, so there's a, or you can just manually run that. Show. So there's that one, and I believe, not composer, composer patches? Is that, let's see, C Wiggins. Doesn't that, I believe that has a custom command. Or am I making that up? Oh no, uh, it might, but actually now that I, there's actually another one that I decided, 
there's another plugin that was recommended to me. Um, and I was going to add it on this list, but I said not to because I, I never actually used it. So I wanted, you know, but it's actually, um, it's kind of an add on the composer patches that allows you to add patches from the command line. So rather than having to crack open your composer at JSON, uh, you know, it's a, it's a composer add on command, which is what I was, um, why it popped in my head. But you can like run, and I don't know what it is, but, you know, compo composer patches. And then, you know, just type in the description, type in the, or maybe, I don't know what the order is, but obviously it's going to need the dependency, the description, and the path to the patch file. So just a little quicker way of adding a patch rather than cracking up your composer on JSON and manually typing it in there. Um, and I can find that, or yeah, we can probably find that really quick. Uh, let's go back to packages. Well, actually, is it? Uh, command. No, okay, let's just go to. Well, you know what? Ask me. If you're interested, I'll, I can find it afterwards. I'm sure I have it written down somewhere. All right. Well, oh, we're already at. We're almost actually out of time, so that's actually not bad. So uh, I can do another one, or we can wrap things up. Anything else? What composer or plugins? Alright, let's wrap things up. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.